Greetings and welcome to the 2021 Carroll School webinars. I'm Andy Boynton, Dean of the Carroll School of Management at Boston College. I'm pleased to introduce the second session in our three-part series of live webinars titled Post-Pandemic Trajectories, Politics, the Economy, and Global Markets. Today we're joined by the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, Eric Rosengren, who will offer an informed, balanced look at the state of our national economy, monetary policy, and the path forward. The degree of expertise he brings to matters of fiscal policy and economic stability are unmatched, and we're honored to have him here as our featured presenter today. I hope you enjoy the presentation and we'll wrap it up with a live Q&A, so have your questions ready. I also welcome you to register for the panel discussion that we're hosting this Friday at the same time about global markets and investment trends. You can learn more by going to bc.edu slash webinars. Good morning. My name is Mark Seidner, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to uh, today's session. Uh, as Andy said, we are thrilled to welcome today's speaker at the 2021 Carroll School webinar. He's Eric Rosengren, President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, which is one of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks. Um, as CEO, Eric leads the Boston Fed's work, which includes economic research and analysis, banking supervision and financial stability efforts, community economic development activities, and a wide range of payment technology and financial and finance initiatives. In addition, Eric is a participant on the Federal Open Market Committee, the monetary policy body of the United States Federal Reserve. He was appointed president of the Boston Fed in 2007, and he has taken a rigorous data-driven approach in forming his views on the national and regional economy. His research and policy positions pay close attention to both aspects of the Fed's dual mandate, labor market outcomes, as well as price stability. Eric's work as a researcher and now as a policymaker has often focused on financial stability issues and their impact on the real Main Street economy. Eric has also led a number of efforts to expand the Boston Fed's outreach and impact on low and moderate income communities. This includes hosting sizable foreclosure prevention workshops for New England residents during the Great Recession and running a competition and post-industrial New England communities to develop cross-sector collaborations and ultimately help improve the lives of lower income residents. Eric holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Colby College, where he serves as the chair of the board of trustees. He earned a master's and doctorate in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It is my great pleasure and honor to present to you this morning, Eric Rosengren. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I appreciate those opening remarks. And uh, just let my uh, PowerPoint get loaded up and I'll begin here. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I've given quite a few talks on the real side of the economy over the last few months. So uh, this is going to be a slightly different talk and it's really gonna focus a little bit more on some of the inflation concerns that have uh, been rising as we've seen uh, a number of disruptions, many of them pandemic induced that have caused uh, reported inflation to rise. So I'm gonna give a little perspective on that. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, I'm happy to report that actually I'm quite optimistic about the economy. Uh, and that's particularly true in New England because New England has relative to the rest of the country been quite successful at getting people vaccinated. So if you look at the six New England states, we're among the top 10 in vaccination rates and more than half of adults in New England have received at least one shot. So that gives me a great deal of confidence that uh, while many of the New England states were quite conservative in terms of uh, having quite a few restrictions related to the COVID problem, uh, we should be in a situation where most of those constraints are going to be released as the impact of the vaccinations mean that infection rates will go down and people will once again start to be able to conduct business in a much more normal fashion. And so I really am expecting a more normalized summer this year. Uh, 
Uh, I think we're already beginning to see it in the high frequency data. So if you look at air travel, while it's still uh, dramatically lower than it was prior to the pandemic, uh, there are more people that are getting on plane. In fact, I'm gonna get on my first plane uh, at the end of this month. Uh, and I'm pretty conservative when it comes to travel with the virus. So uh, if I'm using myself as a benchmark, uh, I think more people that are vaccinated that are going to start doing some of the things that they missed doing over the last year. And high on my list is also going to restaurants. Um, so uh, I think those are some of the areas that were most impacted because of the need for social distancing. Uh, but I would expect these uh, sectors of the economy to come back quite quickly. So I am expecting very rapid growth and real output. Uh, the FOMC had a six and a half percent growth rate as of March. And I would say a lot of the incoming data has uh, been more positive and that's at an annual rate for this year. Um, and we've seen notable improvements in payroll employment and I expect that trend to continue. Uh, nonetheless, I would highlight that uh, while I'm expecting uh, strong growth and a lot more jobs being created over the course of this year, I would highlight that we need to create an awful lot of jobs because of the number of jobs lost during the pandemic. So the unemployment rate, at least until Friday when we get the new release, uh, is currently at 6%. That's still relatively high and certainly quite a bit higher than what we were experiencing prior to the pandemic. And so we really need the kind of growth that we're seeing. And that's one reason I think fiscal and monetary policy have been so accommodative. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a little bit different than coming out of the financial crisis. Coming out of the financial crisis, uh, we did get some fiscal stimulus, but it was shut off relatively early uh, in the cycle. And while monetary policy was quite accommodative during the financial crisis, we actually had a very slow recovery. And uh, my hope is that we're going to see a much more rapid recovery this time around. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, certainly, fiscal policy being unusually stimulative is one of those reasons. Uh, it looks like uh, we're going to continue to have a variety of measures taken by fiscal authorities over the course of this year. And that's on top of what already has been very expansionary fiscal policy. I also expect that interest rates will remain low until the economy gets closer to full employment and until we're more consistently delivering on our 2% inflation rate, which is uh, the target for the Federal Reserve. Uh, one of the main points that I wanna highlight uh, over the course of this talk is that we're seeing unusual distortions in uh, much of the government statistics related to pandemic related events. And so I'm gonna be actually highlighting series. Normally I smooth out many of my series because I wanna talk about trends. Uh, but many of my slides today are actually going to be uh, not smoothed out with the purpose of highlighting kind of how the pandemic impacted some of the higher frequency data, but also some of the government statistics we're going to be uh, seeing shortly. And I think a good example will be uh, the payroll employment and retail sales, which have shown ebbs and flows depending on whether infection rates were going up or going down. And I'm gonna highlight also that the inflation numbers that we've just received and the inflation numbers I'm expecting to receive over the next couple of months are very much likely to be distorted by pandemic effects. Now, what the Federal Reserve cares about is underlying inflation. So while we should certainly be focused on how these distortions are affecting prices, uh, in terms of longer run monetary policy, what we really wanna capture is that underlying trend. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna really be focusing on this ebbs and flows in the data, particularly as it relates to inflation. And so I think one of the primary reasons for why people are very confident inflation is likely to be over 2% over the course of this year is that um, in the outset of the pandemic, prices declined very substantially as firms tried to unload their inventories and get ready for what was going to be uh, partly a government mandated shutdown and partly a consumer driven shutdown as people uh, were trying to socially distance. So the data from last spring is particularly depressed as it relates to prices. Uh, 
because of the reaction of businesses to the outset of the pandemic. But there are other factors also that are aggravating some of the blips in the data. Uh, oil prices, uh, it's a commodity, and so it's very tied to what's happening in the spot market and what's happening currently in the economy. So at the outset of the pandemic, oil prices declined very significantly. Uh, they came back somewhat in the summer as infections were reduced. Uh, and then as the pandemic, uh, once again, unfortunately, occurred in the fall, uh, we saw prices getting depriced once again. And now as the economy is opening up, we've seen oil prices come back to very close to the levels that we were seeing around the pre-pandemic period. There are also supply disruptions. So uh, a number of things I'm gonna highlight, but uh, imported prices, not surprisingly, the rest of the world is not doing as well as the United States uh, because they don't have as many vaccines as we have. And so we're actually benefiting disproportionately from the presence of uh, plentiful vaccines um, so that many people uh, have already taken advantage of getting vaccinated and there's certainly availability for those that want to. But as we see the headlines from Brazil and India and the tragic events occurring, particularly in emerging markets, but also in parts of Europe as well, um, there are many people that are shipping from uh, Asia, Europe, and other places that are still being impacted by the pandemic. In addition, uh, even getting the ships unloaded, there are a lot of delays at our ports. And so all these disruptions are causing the cost of imports to go up a little bit more quickly. Uh, some of these are likely to be disruptions that are gonna smooth out over time. And then I would also emphasize that demand has surged. So it's relatively unusual that people have not been able for the last year to readily take advantage of planes and restaurants and other kinds of activities uh, that uh, were impacted by the social distancing. So as there's a surge in demand for both services and commodities, it's not surprising that if it's a limited supply uh, that firms are going to raise prices to deal with some of the surge that we're going to be seeing over the course of the spring. So that all implies a temporary increase in reported inflation that's going to occur for the spring and probably part of the summer. I do expect though that uh, over time, many of these problems will smooth out. If you remember at the outset of the pandemic, it was virtually impossible to buy toilet paper or Clorox. Uh, those are now well stocked in most grocery stores and are no longer a problem. And I'm pretty confident that that's gonna be true for many of the things that are in short supply now. Uh, the advantage of a market economy is things in short supply, the price goes up and people start producing more and the price comes back down. So I do think that a lot of these are temporary shocks that are going to smooth out over time. So overall, I am expecting the inflation rate to be close to our 2% trend. We're likely to be a little bit higher um, over the course of this year. Uh, I am expecting, and I'll show some private sector forecasts that are indicating that they're expecting some of those uh, blips in inflation to go away in the following year. Uh, but we had a lot of difficulty reaching our 2% inflation after the great financial crisis. So I think it's important not only so that we get back to full employment more quickly and help those that have been badly impacted by the pandemic, uh, but also we wanna be sure we actually hit our inflation target this time around. Uh, we had a lot of trouble doing that uh, after the last recession. And so one of the lessons learned from that is that the Federal Reserve should probably be more patient and more focused on outcomes uh, than just its forecasts. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna take you through a series of charts that uh, provide you an overview of the data as Mark's uh, remarks highlighted, I like data and uh, tend to be very data focused. And I try to make my charts pretty understandable, but I'll try to walk through them relatively quickly. Um, this first chart gets at mobility. And so uh, mobility, think of it as an index related to how likely you are to be moving around relative to one year ago. And the way they get this data is by uh, tracking your phones. And so there's anonymous data that tracks how people have been moving and whether they're leaving their house and where they're going. And so this data does give an indication of how quickly the economy is opening up uh, because one of the features is that many sectors 
actually require people to be present. Uh, so you don't, you have to be present to shop in a store, you have to be present to go to a restaurant, you have to be present to book a hotel or to stay in a hotel. Um, so that social distancing is a, a key component of thinking about how the pandemic's affecting the economy. As you would expect, uh, with the shutdown in the economy that occurred at the outset of the pandemic, the mobility index has declined very significantly. You can see that they did rise over the course of uh, that spring, as uh, we were able to open up as the infection rate went down, basically stabilized over the summer. And then we've seen, uh, particularly more recently, uh, that um, we are seeing much more mobility than what we were seeing at the outset of the pandemic. I would highlight, though, that we're still substantially down from where we were pre-pandemic. Next slide, please. And this shows you high frequency spending data. So this is looking at credit cards and reflecting on how your spending is relative uh, to uh, the same time last year. And there are two lines. The green line is for spending that was not badly impacted by social distancing. And the blue line are for those sectors of the economy that we would expect to be badly impacted by social distancing. So the blue line is going to include things like restaurants, airline travel, uh, hotels, um, and tourism. And the green line is going to cover those areas, primarily things like manufacturing um, that were not particularly impacted by consumers having to social distance. As you can see from the green line, um, from the high frequency spending data, we're basically spending about what we were spending a year ago already when it comes to those areas of the economy not impacted by social distancing. If you look at the areas that are impacted in social distancing, it looks a little bit like the previous chart that uh, a big decline as the pandemic began, uh, it started to pick up uh, as infection rates went down in the summer. We had a bit of a lull as we got into the fall and infection rates rose. And uh, we're once again, as the uh, vaccine has rolled out uh, very successfully in the United States, uh, we're once again seeing some of that socially distanced uh, spending uh, occurring more readily. But I would highlight that we still have a pretty long way to go. So it's percentages on the index. And so this indicates that we're in terms of spending on socially distanced type of spending, we're down by more than 20%. So that indicates there's a su still substantial room as people get vaccinated and get more comfortable uh, getting back into the workplace. Uh, many of you are living downtown Boston, but Boston is not the city that uh, many people left uh, at the pre-pandemic. And uh, you see that walking the streets of Boston, uh, but you also see it in this data uh, that a lot of people are still pretty reluctant to um, start spending on things that require them to uh, be less socially distanced than they have been over the last year. Next slide, please. So this shows retail sales. And this is an example of data that uh, I normally would show quite smooth, but this is showing percent change from previous month. And the reason for that is I just wanna show uh, in a number of the charts, how dramatically the pandemic affected kind of the underlying data. So retail sales uh, get at what people are spending and consumption is uh, roughly two thirds of the total goods and services that we produce in the United States. And so um, we care very much about how consumer is willing or unwilling to spend. And what you can see is at the outset of the pandemic, uh, retail sales declined quite dramatically. As states opened up and the infection rate went down, uh, part of that increase that you're seeing is uh, both uh, people getting more comfortable going out of their houses once again. So there was a surge in spending related to that. And uh, people also probably a surge in some of the spending that you might not have done. I know there's a lot of people who have houses that bought patio furniture around that time that they didn't have before, as they were realizing they were gonna be spending much more time uh, outside than they might normally do. Um, as we got into 
the fall in the infections uh, once again, unfortunately rose. You can see that retail sales again declined. And then we started to see uh, increases as um, the economies picked up as a result of uh, vaccination rates. So what this highlights is if I was looking at a year over year average, if I drop those big negative signs, it's gonna look like a really big increase. At times when I'm dropping the very big increases, it's going to have the exact opposite effect. So as we look at smooth data, we have to be aware that the underlying data is really being impacted by kind of the ebbs and flows from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, a lot of attention has gone to inflation. And so uh, this uh, two charts are looking at what a group of private sector forecasts. So this is not the Federal Reserve forecast. This is a group of roughly 50 forecasters, um, all private sector forecasters. So uh, they have an incentive to try to get it right. And what it shows is what their inflation forecast is for 2021 on the left and 2022 on the right. And so let's start on the left. So the number of forecasters is on the vertical axis. So when you see a large column, that's indicating a lot of people had that expectation for inflation over the course of 2021. And uh, I mentioned earlier, our inflation target is 2%. And what you can see is both the average and the median is at 2.3% uh, for 2021. So that's slightly above what our inflation target is. And that green dot uh, just shows you that uh, 2.3, and we didn't just count the numbers, it depends whether you count from the right or the left, but uh, the median is uh, at 2.3 and that green dot shows you where the median is. And you can also see that uh, the forecasters are pretty bunched. So uh, the bulk of the forecasts are between 2.1 and 2.5%. So they're pretty narrowly spread. You know, there's some outlier forecasts, but uh, as forecasting goes, people seem pretty confident uh, we're gonna be in that relatively narrow range. Now, if you look at 2022, what you can see is, first of all, the forecasters are more spread out. There are more forecasters actually that have expectations that inflation will be under 2%. And you also have a few more forecasters that are expecting it to be a, a, a good bit higher than what the, the median or the average is. Now, I first call your attention to the median and the consensus forecast, which is the average, and it's 2%. So 2% uh, is exactly the Fed's inflation target it's three tenths below what they're forecasting for this year. So it's showing that the private sector forecasts actually are expecting a surge in inflation this year that largely gets offset next year. Now you might ask, why do so many forecasters have a forecast under 2%? After all, I've already told you the economy is going to be growing quite strongly. The Fed's inflation target is 2% and we're likely to be growing faster than 2% this year. And the reason for that is if you use a statistical model that uses the data particularly heavily weighted to the last 20 years, we were not particularly successful at getting to a 2% inflation target uh, after the financial crisis. And so if you incorporate that data in a statistical model, uh, you might be somewhat reluctant to predict that we're really gonna get much of a surge in inflation. And I think that's what you're reflecting among the forecasters that are below 2%. You obviously have some forecasters that uh, think that it's going to pick up, but I would highlight relative to many of the headlines that you may have seen over the last couple of weeks, this is indicating that private sector forecasts who do this for a living are seeing the underlying inflation rate over the next two years to be a little higher than 2% this year, but right around 2% next year. There's definitely a spread. Uh, but this would not be a situation where I would be at all alarmed uh, if these forecasters have it about right. Next slide, please. So once again, I wanna show you the ebbs and flows of the inflation data, because when we think about inflation annualized over a year, these ebbs and flows are gonna start making a difference. So you can see, I'm showing you two inflation indices. 
One is the CPI, which is a basket of goods that uh, try to reflect the basket of goods that most Americans spend. And then there's the personal consumption expenditure index, which is tied to uh, the GDP accounts. It is the PCE measure that uh, is the target of the Fed's inflation forecast, even though it is the CPI that many people uh, probably most focus on in the releases. Uh, the first thing to note is that these indices are not exactly equivalent, so you don't see the horizontal lines are exactly the same. There are month-to-month -month differences. They weigh things like healthcare costs and housing somewhat differently, but the general trend is quite similar. And you can see that the pandemic did play a big impact on uh, the monthly inflation numbers. So at the beginning of the pandemic, as I mentioned earlier, prices declined quite substantially. And I would highlight that we're currently in the period where some of these very large negative observations are gonna drop out. So if you just put your hand over the screen over March and April, you get a different view than if you, only, if you looked at the entire screen, which just tells you that when I start the series and when I end the series is actually gonna make a difference for how it's measured. Um, and that's gonna continue to occur over the course of this year. So in the summer, as uh, the pandemic ebbed and infection rates were down, prices did go up pretty significantly. Uh, as infections once again increased in the fall, you can see that uh, prices did not increase as rapidly. And you can see that more recently, uh, we have seen price increases. So this just highlights that you're gonna to have to be a little careful about data releases and people that exploit the fact that month to month changes were unusually large. So we normally think of inflation as a pretty smooth process. You normally don't expect it to be particularly bumpy. And uh, because of this last year, this is gonna be bumpy data, which means uh, you're, you know, if people wanna hype up data, they're gonna be throwing out a lot of the spring data. And uh, it is gonna matter as we go through the window that annualized inflation rates are going to look different depending on which of these periods uh, are the starting point. Next slide, please. So another reason to think that inflation is uh, going to be somewhat higher this year is because of the role of energy prices. So I highlighted that commodity prices had improved. And uh, this is an example of exactly what I was warning you about. So if you look at energy prices today relative to a year ago, energy prices were unusually depressed a year ago and they have come back. So if I look at a percent change from a year earlier, it looks like energy prices have gone up very rapidly. Now, if I picked a different point, either pre-pandemic or more recently, the energy prices would not look nearly as dramatic. Uh, and you can see that when you take the energy prices out, which looks at all items, less food and energy, uh, that measure of inflation is still quite well behaved and is in fact uh, below our 2% inflation target. Next slide, please. So this just shows you uh, oil prices, and this shows you it uh, not annualized like I did in the previous chart, and uh, shows you the total PCE price index. So this has not taken food and energy out. And what you can see is that the PCE index uh, does move in general. Uh, it gets impacted by large price movements in oil. Oil is still a fundamental input to much of our economy. And so uh, you can see that these are reasonably highly correlated series. And in part, one of the reasons we're seeing that the PCE price index more recently has gone up is in part that we've seen commodity prices in particular oil prices going up uh, pretty dramatically um, as the vaccination rate has occurred. And as oil traders become much more convinced that uh, social distancing will decline, people will get back in cars and planes, and we will once again be consuming oil products much more than we were before. Next slide, please. I mentioned shipping costs, and this just shows you what's been happening with shipping costs. It's just an index uh, 
uh, a very typical index to use is the Baltic Dry Index, uh, which is uh, frequently used in freight forwarding pricing. And uh, I mean, don't be too alarmed by this because I do view this as primarily a temporary surge. So right now it is very hard to get a container ship and it's very hard to get an oil tanker. It's even hard to get containers to put your goods in. Um, and as a result, as you would expect, if there are a lot of people that want ships and not many ships available that aren't already booked, you're going to see the price for shipping go up. And that's exactly what we've seen over the course of the fall and uh, the winter is that as people have become increasingly confident that the economy is going to open up. Uh, many uh, firms are trying to restock inventories. Uh, there have been shortages of a variety of uh, commodities. The auto industry is being affected by a shortage of chips. If you're trying to buy a dishwasher right now, uh, good luck. Uh, it's not that easy to buy a lot of the white goods because people are buying homes and wanting the newest appliances but I'm pretty confident that over time, those types of goods are going to once again become available. Uh, there will be people that decide to build ships and shipping costs will once again go down and our ports will be able to unload uh, the container ships as they come into the ports more readily than they can right now. But it does mean that we're gonna see temporary increases in prices that partly reflect that things like shipping costs have definitely gone up. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows you uh, U.S. import prices, and what's kind of interesting is that the import prices, you know, reasonably closely reflect what we were seeing in the overall um, PCE and CPI chart, and in part that's because uh, most exporters price to the U.S. market. So, not surprisingly, um, it shows some of the same pandemic patterns. Uh, but on top of the general pandemic patterns, I would emphasize that if you're an importer and you're being affected by uh, the virus right now in your own country, let's say you're in India, it's going to be difficult to produce, it's going to be difficult to ship, and you know that there is a surge in the number of Americans looking to purchase goods, uh, this is a great time to be raising prices. And so at least one of the factors that is affecting the price of imports uh, is also pandemic related. And this pattern looks quite strikingly similar. You know, it doesn't exactly match, but looks quite similar to the pattern that we were seeing in overall prices. So we are going to expect that imported prices will have some of the same temporary surges uh, that we saw in overall prices. Next slide, please. Now, one of the challenges have been that many of our retailers have moved to an inventory system that counts on getting goods and uh, relatively close to the point of sale. And what that means is that when you have a pandemic, first of all, you don't want to be stuck with a lot of inventory. So you try to sell the things on your shelf. You don't know when you're going to be able to open up and inventories decline. And you can see that inventories did decline quite dramatically. You can see that inventories have picked up. And one reason I think that it hasn't picked up as much as you would expect from the trend in the line and from the fact that demand uh, for goods and services has increased substantially is uh, what I was showing in the previous charts, that right now it's actually hard to restock your shelves because it's hard to actually get the goods, uh, many of which are produced abroad. And so there are shortages of a variety of items. So even if you want to restock your shelves, it's not that easy to do that. Uh, what that also means, if you're looking for great bargains when you go to the stores, when you're finally comfortable to shop in stores again, uh, I wouldn't expect great bargains over the next couple of months, in part because uh, the stores are already having trouble restocking their shelves. So if you were inclined to have sales, you're going to wait until you actually have a plentiful supply of goods in your shop before you start once again running sales. And that's going to be another factor that affects prices. I would also highlight that one reason we're going, not only are consumers expecting to have a surge in demand that's been pent up over the last year, but you're going to see a lot of businesses that are going to be doing a lot of spending. Some of that is going to be on inventories as they just try to restock their shelves. 
So you're going to see a combination of large inventory expenditures on top of a large number of consumer expenditures, which is one reason why most forecasts are so confident that we're going to have a very strong recovery in this year. And many forecasters are at six and a half percent or stronger for real GDP growth. Uh, that is a, a number that's more akin to what you would normally see in a developing economy like China. Uh, you normally don't see that even during a recovery period in the United States. But the combination of opening up and these various uh, supply shocks that I've been emphasizing uh, all indicate that we're likely to have very strong growth this year. Next slide, please. Now, the underlying inflation rate, one of the things that affects the underlying inflation rate is wages and salaries. And so I'm showing you two indices. And again, I want to highlight how the pandemic has impacted underlying series. So you're going to have to be very careful when people look at one series or another and start getting particularly alarmist. So the average hourly earnings uh, looks at average hourly earnings of uh, uh, employees. And what's important about this series is if a group of employees get laid off, they're not in the series. And so you can get compositional changes around times where there are big layoffs or large hiring. And as we know, during the pandemic, there were large layoffs. There were particularly large layoffs of poorly paying jobs. So when you think about hotel workers, restaurant workers, and people that work in retail stores, uh, they frequently are not particularly well paid. They're particularly getting either around minimum wage or somewhat above minimum wage. So if all those workers are no longer counted or not, not counted for this period, but the people that do have jobs, and that includes people that can work remotely, um, many of whom tend to be higher paid, the average hourly earnings number is going to look like a very big number because the people that are reporting earnings are the people that are paid quite well. And so this is partly a compositional change in the underlying index. An alternative index, the employment cost index, standardizes for that effects. So it looks at compositional changes in the workforce and corrects for that to try to get at the underlying uh, employee cost. And that is your green line there. And that green line, as you can see, is quite smooth. Now, when you think that, um, if you think of inflation likely to be around 2%, and you think of productivity being positive, the kind of wages and salaries implied by the employment cost index are not at all alarming. This is about what I would expect if I was expecting an underlying rate of inflation of around 2%. So one of the things I'm gonna be closely looking at is I'm not going to be putting much weight on average hourly earnings because I know that the compositional changes are gonna be important over this next year, but I am gonna put more weight on the employment cost index, which at least to date is well behaved. But if we start seeing this go up uh, dramatically, that would be a warning sign that maybe uh, the price increases that I'm expecting to be primarily temporary maybe there is more movement to incorporate um, the underlying inflation rate being a little bit higher than people are anticipating. So I think this is an important series to watch over time. Next slide, please. So this slide just highlights, uh, before I showed you the distribution of forecasts, this actually shows you what that blue chip forecast actually expects uh, through 2022 uh, quarter four. And what you can see is that they do see a blip up over the course of 2021. Uh, it then comes back down and it's you know, pretty moderate right around 2%. So that blue line is the average of those 50 forecasters. And that's quite consistent with the chart that I showed you that had the individual forecasters. The dashed line just shows you the, the on the top, it's the dashed line of the average of the 10 highest. And on the bottom, it's the average of the 10 lowest. The reason I want to emphasize that is I don't find the spread particularly alarming either. So while you may be seeing alarming reports and there are financial market participants that uh, may have an incentive to have alarming uh, inflation forecasts, uh, 
you can see that most of the forecasters are well around 2%. The bulk of the forecasts are around 2%. Even taking kind of more of the outlier forecasts, we're not talking about runaway inflation. We're not talking about a deflation. We're talking about numbers that are a little bit above or a little bit below 2%. So I think this is a pretty good underlying forecast that we're going to see blips and certainly measured inflation is likely to be noisier than this forecast. But I am expecting that uh, the underlying trend of around 2% is what we're likely to see over the course of this year and over the course of next year with a little bit more of the measured inflation this year and a little less of the measured inflation for the variety of reasons I've highlighted next year. Next slide, please. So just some concluding observations. Uh, be aware of people reporting data that are annualized over the course of this year. And that's true for measured inflation. Um, and so uh, you should be thinking about this, uh, these charts as you see uh, somewhat exploitive news reports on surges of inflation over the course of the spring and into the summer. Because um, I do think that the most likely outcome is the acceleration is likely to prove temporary. Um, and we are expecting, much like the private sector forecasters, or I am expecting much like the private sector forecasts, that we're still going to be hovering around 2% if I were to give this talk uh, a year and a half from now. However, I would highlight that there is uncertainty. Uh, when we look at our underlying data, we don't have any pandemics in the post-World War II period. Most of our statistical work does not go prior to post-World War II. Most of it doesn't even go back to World War II. So um, it is possible that people's behavior coming out of something as big a shock as a pandemic are going to cause change behaviors. And in particular, we may find that wages and prices are more sensitive to tight labor markets that I do expect to be occurring over the course of next year. So while I am reasonably confident based on the data we have to date that we're likely to be around 2%, I am also a central banker that worries about standard errors and worries about errors and forecasts. And so I have to be concerned that uh, it is quite possible that in significant sectors of the economy, people will behave differently. And that may appear in some of the GDP series. Uh, it remains to be seen how quickly people get back fully to planes and uh, restaurants and hotels, for example. But it's also uh, what wages and salaries are needed to attract people back to the workforce. So if people are reluctant to get vaccinated and we still have infections that are a problem. People may be reluctant to come back into the workforce uh, I haven't, in my previous talks, I talked about labor markets. I haven't emphasized that as much this time, but I would say that a lot of people stopped looking for work. Uh, that could be because they didn't think their jobs were going to be there, but I think it's also because people were worried about childcare and people were worried about health issues. And uh, as a result, some of these economic relationships that have been pretty consistent uh, since 2000 may turn out to be different. So I think we need to be alert to that. I would also highlight that the Fed is behaving somewhat differently than it did in previous recovery periods. In previous recovery periods, we tended to react more to forecasts and be particularly concerned that inflation would pick up too quickly. Uh, this time, we're much more focused on actual outcomes. And one of our concerns is uh, that despite the surge in some prices that we're seeing, that uh, actual outcomes, it may be difficult to get just to 2% as some of the private sector forecasts uh, highlighted in that dot plot that I showed you. So I think it's very important to be careful of incoming data and how people report on that data. Um, what we really care about is underlying inflation trends. My own forecast and that forecast of most private sector forecasts are not at all alarming. So we shouldn't overreact to just temporary price movements, many of which you would expect as we see a surge in spending as we come out of the pandemic and that's by both households and businesses. So I'll stop there and be happy to take some questions. Eric, thank you very, very much for a uh, very thoughtful and, and informative uh, discussion. Um, it is
after the year we've all had, it is refreshing uh, to hear uh, an optimistic uh, outlook. Uh, so thank you for that. I and mean, obviously one of the takeaways uh, is the, the rapid growth that we should all be experiencing over the course of the next 12 months or so. And, 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 and equally interesting is sort of the discussion of, of the, the robust discussion on inflation and, and the, the temporary and, and transitory factors that will it may drive up inflation in the near term, but but might have longer term restraining um, restraining forces. What I'll probably do in the time we have for questions is um, try to summarize a number of the questions or try to consolidate a number of the questions we've got from 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 the audience. If that's all right with you, it will start focusing on inflation since it's the topic of your of your of your of your of your talk with us today. Maybe then switch and spend a little bit of time on on the real economy, um, and then and then perhaps uh, end with a few questions on. Um, on policy, on monetary policy. Um, but I'm not going to let you get away without telling us where you're going to get on a plane and go to. Uh, so that'll, that'll be the last question, if you're willing to, uh, if you're willing to share, because it's, it's nice to hear that you're actually planning on getting on a plane. I, uh, I've, 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 I've been doing that as well. You, you, let me start just on, on inflation. You, you, you spent a lot of time on the sort of the cyclical outlook, 2021, 2022. I wonder if you can talk, you, you gave a speech in the middle of uh, April, I believe, or towards the middle of April, where, where you commented on sort of the two-sided risks to inflation. And I wonder if you can sort of open up the aperture a little bit and think a little bit more or describe a little bit more secularly, secularly your views. Um, we had come from a, a period post-GFC, post-global financial crisis, where, where demographics, technological disruption, uh, labor market uncertainty, we're all sort of combining, plus other factors, combining to keep inflation and inflation expectations low. Have those longer term secular factors gone away or do they, do they still factor into your, into your longer term forecasts? Well, that's one of the reasons I think economists are reasonably confident that inflation over the longer term is most likely to be restrained. So uh, if you try to look at the relationship between very low unemployment rates, tight labor markets, and how wages and prices move. If you look through the periods of the 70s and 80s, it would look like wages and prices were quite responsive to very tight labor markets. If instead you focus on the period uh, uh, since 2000, it's very hard to see much of a, a reaction to tight labor markets. So certainly one of the reasons for that is technology has enabled uh, an opening up of the global economy. We still import an awful lot of goods. And that's particularly true for commodities that can be produced or manufactured goods that can be produced um, you know, anywhere in the world. So uh, many manufacturers have chosen to locate in low wage areas of the world and ship those goods to the United States and other developed economies. So that trend, I don't think it's gonna go away. Um, I think that's going to continue to particularly impact uh, goods. I would say where there's a bigger question mark is on services. So um, in the service area, uh, you don't have as much competition from abroad on services, because if I want to get a haircut, I can't get a haircut uh, by going abroad, or it would be a very expensive haircut to do so. Um, so if uh, my barber decides to raise rates, it's not going to matter that I could get a much cheaper haircut somewhere else in the world. Um, and as a result, local market conditions may be more important. And as I highlighted in my talk, some of those lo local market conditions may be impacted by the pandemic and the willingness of people to do things like be barbers in an environment where face-to-face -face contact may not be as alluring as it was before. So um, it's just a, a simple example, but I do think that while I do expect that uh, inflation will be well restrained, I think if I was to start seeing a divergence that I would want to start thinking more carefully about, it would really be on the service side of the economy. And so, um, you know, more than likely, uh, that is not going to occur. And uh, we should also see that in government statistics, looking at wages and salaries and compensation. But if we start seeing those being more responsive to tight labor markets, and I would emphasize right now, we don't have tight labor markets, so it's not an immediate concern. But I do expect by the end of next year that we are going to have unemployment rates in the range that most economists think is close to full employment. And we might very well go past many economists views of what is full employment. So we are gonna have tight labor markets if we have two years of rapid growth. 
And so uh, this is going to be an unusual recovery in how rapidly we're growing. Um, and it does mean that we'll have to just make sure that some of those underlying relationships on inflation don't change. You are giving me flashbacks to this time last year where I would have paid anything to get a haircut and, and what my hair looked like at the time. So, uh, so, so, so thank you for that. There's, a, there's an interesting question. I, mean, I, I suppose um, uh, modeling inflation expectations is a very, very difficult thing to do. And, and there was a question from, from the audience just about, and you see it, and I think, I think it was one in the Wall Street Journal today, sort of these sensational headlines about inflation risks uh, with many, I mean, as, as you said, private sector has, has a, has a, have, have incentives to get it right. But at the same time, there are many that seem to be rather sensationalist on the, on the inflation view, not to give, you know, not, not to ask you specifically about those views, but, but how prevalent are headlines and just sort of the, the news of inflation risk in setting inflation expectations in your, in your mind and how possible is just the, the just the, the information overload becoming self-fulfilling? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Um, inflation expectations have been very slow moving over the course of the last couple of years. And in fact, if you look at forecasters who do this for a living, they've been pretty much locked to 2% inflation over most of the last two decades. And, you know, they've been overshooting on what actual outcomes have been. Uh, if you look at uh, Michigan survey or some of the other measures of inflation expectations, they tend to be higher and not actually that responsive to the fact that we've been systematically under that inflation rate. Mm -hmm. But I would say what you're not seeing is measures in surveys or in forecasters that indicate a rapid increase right now or the likelihood of a rapid increase right now. Now that's something that we, as you say, uh, it's tough to model. And if people become convinced that prices are going to come up, move much more quickly than the Fed has said it's going to, um, then that would be something that we'd have to take into account. My best guess is that the Fed does have the tools if inflation picks up too rapidly to do take actions to try to prevent that from happening. So you need kind of two things. You need uh, the behaviors to change or the expectations to change and then you need the Fed to not react to that. And I'm very confident that the Fed will react to it if we start seeing inflation numbers that uh, become problematic. I'm curious, you showed the, the distribution of, of uh, professional forecasters inflation views for 2021 and 2022. And you just commented about you know, the, the risk of you know, a concern would be a rapid increase. Is there a level in your mind if you looked at forecasts, whether it be from professional forecasters or for market-based uh, information such as the inflation protected bond market and the, the, the break-even spread, is there a level that would get concerning to you or is that, is, that, is that too specific? I mean, there is a level that I would be concerned, but uh, for example, the total PCE right now is at 2.3% and I'm not at all concerned. I mean, I, it really is by intention, monetary policy is trying to overshoot our 2% inflation target, because we want to get an average over time of inflation at 2%. And we've just left a period uh, of roughly a decade where we've undershot. And so um, being a little bit over 2% doesn't worry me at all. The only way you get an average of 2% is sometimes you're above and sometimes you're below. Um, you know, if we started seeing a number that didn't start with two, yeah, that would worry me if I thought that was an underlying inflation rate and not just a temporary blip. If I saw um, labor costs going up much more rapidly and contract renewals indicating that expectations had dramatically changed, uh, that will give me a pause as well. But I'm not seeing either of those things occurring right now. That actually brings up a, a another topic, maybe just to, to help you explain to the to the layperson, such as such as ourselves, the Fed's shift in in sort of monetary policy strategy to adopting a, a flexible average inflation targeting approach. What does that What does that mean practically in terms of of, of your thinking about the the establishment of appropriate monetary policy? So, if you looked at previous recovery periods. Once we had gotten to a 6% unemployment, we frequently have already started to raise rates. And so the unemployment rate right now is 6%. We're expecting a very strong economy. 
and we're expecting the unemployment rate to go down and payroll employment to go up quite rapidly. And that is our forecast, and yet we are not raising rates. So what it highlights is that we want to be more focused on outcomes than just our forecast. We're not going to be uh, acting as quickly as we did in the past. So we want to be sure that we actually can hit 2% inflation. So I think our the old way we reacted primarily was reflecting in the 70s and part of the 80s that we let inflation get out of control and we weren't rapid enough in probably responding. But since mid 1980s, the exact opposite has been true. And so we don't want to um, cause the unemployment. There are a lot of benefits to a tight labor market. And that's particularly true coming out of a pandemic where so many low income workers have become unemployed. And so that tight labor market helps low income workers who are disproportionately people with higher, less educational attainment and tend to be uh, minorities as well. And so I think there are huge benefits to that tight labor market. And we shouldn't try to prevent what is a really good outcome in the labor market for fears of inflation that over the last 20 years has not appeared despite many people forecasting otherwise. To what extent do you think the extended unemployment benefits have, have limited the, the labor force labor market participation rates so far and and as they roll off in the fall does do you sort of expect the supply of labor to to increase perhaps you know in the in the marginally attached and, and others that would would come back once the once the enhanced benefits run off yeah i think that's one of many reasons for why labor force participation is quite a bit lower than what we were seeing pre-pandemic so when schools are closed, a lot of people pulled out of the labor market because they had to take care of children. Uh, the fact that we don't have comprehensive childcare in the United States, and this is something fiscal policy is trying to address, but um, uh, means that an awful lot of people pulled out of the labor force. And unfortunately, they're disproportionately women who did so. Uh, and that comes out in, in the statistics that you look at for labor force participation rate. In addition, uh, many people were probably worried, particularly if they were over 50 or had an underlying health condition. They didn't want to go to work because they were worried about mortality with uh, out getting the vaccine. So that uh, obviously affects labor force participation as well. But what gave people somewhat of the flexibility to do so is in part that they were able to get unemployment benefits if they lost their job. Um, and for many low income workers, uh, the rate that we're compensating people is not dramatically different than the rate, the amount of money they would have made if they were employed. So I do think that there are a group of workers for a variety of reasons who are likely to be more comfortable working as we get into the fall. That's the other reason to have a tight labor market. We want those people to come back into the workforce. So it's really costly if people permanently leave the workforce. And so running a tight economy right now has a lot of advantages. Maybe, maybe we could touch on fiscal policy for a, for, a, for a moment. You commented very early in your talk about sort of the one of the differences today versus the, the post global financial crisis period environment was the unusually stimulative fiscal policy. Um, and clearly one of the reasons we've all upgraded our 2021 economic forecast is is the, the increase in in what was expected and what was eventually passed in, in, in March in terms of, of near term fiscal stimulus. As you think about addition, how do you factor in the prospects for additional fiscal stimulus in your outlook for the economy? So whenever we go, so uh, FOMC participants have to forecast uh, on a quarterly basis. So the last forecast was in March. Um, so a lot of what's currently in the pipeline was already well known uh, by March. Now there are significant aspects of current fiscal policy that are still pretty uncertain. So exactly what kind of infrastructure spending is actually gonna come out of Congress and get signed by the president is unclear. So I think most forecasters are expecting something to be signed. Um, my guess is they have different people will come up with different estimates of what they think will actually get passed. Um, and that can have some impact on both the timing and the distribution of what you think is going to happen. Uh, but I would say that uh, 
there is already very strong forecasts across the board and fiscal policy is certainly one of the reasons for that. Um, we do try to factor in what we think is the most likely outcome. I won't talk about what I think the most likely outcome is but because they're probably political pundits who are better at it than I am. Um, but um, we're certainly well aware that there are a number of proposals that would uh, further increase expenditures, but also potentially increase taxes as well. Um, maybe we'll, uh, maybe if, if it's all right with you, um, Eric, we'll, we'll sort of transition, talk a little bit about policy and, and, and the outlook for policy. Um, um, Chairman Powell has said, I think repeatedly, that, that, that the FOMC would like to give uh, as much notice as possible to to market participants and, and to the broader economy of any potential tapering. How do you envision that communication taking place? I mean, the way it would take place is that the FOMC as a group has a discussion about what the kind of communication we wanna have and when the likely uh, change in the tapering will occur. So that's one reason why people that follow the Federal Reserve pay particular attention to our statements, uh, the chair's press conference, and to the minutes of the Federal Reserve that uh, get published with a, a bit of a delay after each of our meetings. Um, so I, the communication would be occurring through kind of those standard channels. Uh, it would probably be highlighted to some extent in our statement. Uh, it would probably be highlighted to some extent by the chair's remarks in the press conference that occurs after each FOMC meeting. Um, and uh, I don't think we're at the point of being particularly specific right now. Uh, we need to have a substantial improvement for us to begin tapering. It is quite possible that we'll see those conditions uh, as we get to the latter half of the year. But right now, what we have is one really strong employment report one quarterly strong GDP report. And so I think it's premature right now to uh, focus on the tapering, uh, but that time will come. And uh, certainly the Fed has no desire to surprise markets. How do you feel about, how, how, can you comment sort of on broader financial conditions? Uh, financial stability is a, is, a, is a keen focus of yours. So I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you could comment on, on financial conditions. Then one specific question that's come from a couple uh, uh, participants in the um, in this session sort of talk about the mix of asset purchases and 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 specifically to mortgage purchases in an environment where the housing market seems quite robust. Can you comment on those on the on the sort of the broader and the more the more specific uh, question? Let me start with the specific. So as was pointed out, we're buying longer term treasury securities and mortgage backed securities. Now I'd highlight the mortgage backed securities that we purchase are uh, government guaranteed. So in many respects, they have attributes that are quite close to uh, the treasury securities that we purchase. And so one of the reasons, the, the mortgage backed security market is a very large market and it is a market that is very relevant to how quickly the economy comes back because it affects uh, to some extent, uh, the cost of refinancing or the ability to get a low interest rate mortgage. So I do think that uh, as we think about tapering, one of the things that we're gonna have to think about is uh, at what speed we taper the treasuries versus the mortgage backed securities. As you point out, my own personal view is that the mortgage market probably doesn't need as much support now. And in fact, one of my financial stability concerns would be if the housing market gets too overheated. So some of these are temporary effects of some people who are living in cities want to be uh, in different locations and are worried about both the pandemic and future pandemics. And with remote work can now, you know, be on Cape Cod or in the coast of Maine and still work in Boston and come to Boston periodically. Um, but we'll see over time how sustainable that is. But I, I I would be concerned if uh, housing prices started rising too quickly. So that is a financial stability concern. Uh, going into the financial crisis, that was one of the big uh, flashing red lights was that housing prices just went up at a rate that was not sustainable. So we know that if households become too levered and take too much risk, that it can have a big impact on the economy. 
And it can particularly be a problem depending on what happens to the securitization of mortgage-backed securities. I would also highlight that there are a variety of infrastructure uh, parts of to financial stability that have not been solved. So one is the money market funds. Uh, one of the reasons why last March and April was so bad was because there was a run on money market funds. Uh, we have not corrected that problem yet. Uh, another problem was that people wanted to all uh, get rid of treasury securities so they could hold cash. And uh, treasury securities get uh, funneled through. Uh, it's probably more detailed than you need, the broker dealers. And there are not that many broker dealers and they have limited balance sheets. Uh, but we need a mechanism that uh, doesn't go through so narrow a funnel for government securities. So I think that's a second area that uh, we need to be concerned about. And I think there's an open question about what happens to commercial real estate. So um, a lot of that depends on how people come back to work and whether some of the very tall buildings in Boston, New York, and San Francisco get filled or are those buildings largely uh, have large vacancies for a significant period of time. Commercial real estate can be an important asset for a number of financial institutions, including mid-sized banks. And so uh, that is something that um, I will continue to focus on. Uh, so I do think we have to worry about financial stability concerns. And one of the challenges of being very patient for monetary policy, as we start getting to a tight labor market, I will be looking uh, for how concerned should we be that asset prices in certain areas of, of the market are becoming um, unusually buoyant. And I don't think we're at that stage now that I would say prices of many assets are fully priced right now and maybe some markets more than fully priced. Um, but if we get down to full employment by the end of next year, interest rates still quite low, uh, I am going to be highly attuned to what's happening in financial markets. You touched on a lot of topics that are near and dear to my heart, so thank you, thank you for that. Maybe just a couple, a couple of quick questions, and then we'll we'll um, we'll let we'll let you get on with with your day. Um, with with heartfelt thanks from from all of us. Um, first of all, as I as I mentioned early in the in the in the in your in the introduction, um, you know the, the impact on low and moderate income communities are an important focus of yours, and I. I just I wonder um, as we go back to this time last year and and the overwhelming support that the Federal Reserve was providing to the economy in a variety of programs, Main Street lending pro the Main Street lending program stands out um, as as one of those possible areas and 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 different folks have different opinions of it. I'm I'm curious your thoughts of the effectiveness of the Main Street lending program. And what what you might do differently in the next downturn or or, or the next crisis to to you know to to allow for policy to to impact sort of the the, the main street rather than rather than the Wall Street. So just in, in full disclosure, I was the person responsible for running the main street program, so I'm not an unbiased uh, uh, observer of this. Um, I think it played an important role. So we helped 1,800 firms, their mid-sized firms. Government policy uh, helped very small firms through the PPP program, and those were basically grants that um, the government just wrote off. Uh, the very large firms were helped by the fact that we had facilities that enabled people to refinance their liabilities. So the, their cost structure got substantially helped. What was left in between were mid-sized firms. So those firms kind of in the one to 250 uh, million dollar, uh, billion dollar range, I think are, uh, you know, those firms, some of them have access to financial markets, some of them don't have access to financial markets, depend on banks, they couldn't use PPP, or it was not enough to really help those firms. And so what the Main Street Lending Program did is it provided a bridge to those firms. Uh, I think for the 1600 firms, it certainly helped provide that bridge. We've had a number of those loans already paid off. So that means that those firms that at that time were not bankable in a bank actually are now bankable now because they're able to refinance out of the program at a rate that they find attractive. So that's exactly what we would like to see. Ideally, most of those firms will pay off the loans, many of them early, um, but we're obviously gonna take some losses. Uh, I would say that I would have preferred to actually have a more expansive program. Uh, 
and it's probably a longer discussion than what I can do right now, but uh, I think we were a little too stingy. And uh, I think it could have gone on for probably another quarter as well. We did 70% of our lending in the month of December. Um, I think there was a significant pipeline of loans that could have been done. Uh, but I do think it was an important support for those firms that were probably not going to get bank financing and otherwise would have shut their doors and left those people unemployed. Very good. Eric, will you tell us where you're heading to at the end of the month? As you said, you're, you're, you're going to get on an airplane. Where are you going to go? Where's the first place? So I haven't seen my mother-in-law in a year. Um, and so my wife and I are going to see my mother-in-law. The reason I give that caveat is it's Key West. And so uh, it's not pure vacation. It's also to visit family, uh, but also there'll be a good bit more sunshine there than there has been in New England over the last month. Well, hopefully it'll be a, a sunny and warm summer in, in, in New England and, and, and the weather outlook will, will um, uh, mirror your economic outlook. Eric, let me say a, a heartfelt thank you from the Boston College community and, and, and particularly the Carroll School for your time, uh, your thoughts and your, your, your discussion uh, uh, this morning. But more importantly, let me say thank you for your steady leadership uh, of the Boston Fed and, and the role, the real role you play in, 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 in the economy and, and how it impacts so many people's lives. So, so thank you, uh, a warm hearted thank you from, from all of us for your time this morning and for your, and for, and for your service. Um, let me also say thank you to those that, that dialed in and, and, and participated in, the, in this call. Um, let me remind you that there's another session on Friday. Which hopefully is equally as, as interesting. It's a it's a, a markets discussion, a panel discussion. Uh, what's on the horizon for investors in in global markets? Um, but please join me in thanking uh, Eric Rosengren for his time um, this morning. Thank you, Eric. I hope we see each other soon. Bye now. Thank you.